We'd like to thank uh, Chaitanya Charan for joining us on the Relevant Relevance Project here. Chaitanya Charan is vastly experienced in speaking all over the world. In fact, he just finished a world tour. He's finally back in India, and he's agreed to meet with us this morning. Relevance is obviously a huge topic, and uh, I can't think of anybody more qualified to give us insights into relevance than Chaitanya Charan, who has written 25 books, given uncountable lectures under all kinds of circumstances, on all continents, to all different kinds of audiences, on any number of subjects. And what I particularly admire about Chaitanya Charan is his flexibility, his versatility. He can speak something on any topic. He has vast eclectic knowledge. Um, he doesn't uh, take a simplistic approach to anything. He sees nuances. He sees shades of meaning. He sees from different points of view. So all of this adds up to whether he would acknowledge it or not to him being an expert on the subject matter of how to make Krishna consciousness, a philosophy that's thousands and thousands of years old, and it comes to us from halfway around the world, how to make that relevant to a Western audience. So Chaitanya Charan, let me, um, first of all, thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your valuable schedule to be with us. I'm excited about your insights um, enriching the lives of many, many future preachers to come. Thank you, Can Prabhu, you tell for us? Me. And uh, personally, I am inspired by your constant attempts to make Krishna consciousness alive and uh, vibrant for, P for potential hearers or receivers of Krishna consciousness. And the fact that we have uh, a relevance group which is pioneering this effort is something which uh, makes me feel uh, feel enlivened all the more. Because we all at individual level do what we can to try to make things relevant. But when at a broader level, a group of leaders take it forward, then yes, now, one of the challenges I feel is that we have our own standards and we, we could have standards with respect to practice, standards with respect to philosophy, standards with respect to etiquette, standards with respect to culture. And we, we either we get caught in patting ourselves on the back for our high standards or slamming ourselves on the back for not following those standards. And in both ways, we get self-obsessed to some extent. And that way, it's uh, not relevant. We don't stay relevant to the world. So just recently, I had this realization. Now, this might seem a little provocative. That we often say that, uh, that you know, chanting is so easy. Hmm? And we compare chanting with, oh, in Satyuga, people had to chant 60,000. I had to go to the forest and meditate for 60,000 years. And in the previous years, they had to do sacrifices. And just see, chanting is so easy as compared to that. Now, yes, from a scriptural perspective, yes, the Sankirtan is an easy process. It's a recommended process. But from our potential audience perspective, they are not comparing our 16 rounds of chanting with 60,000 years of meditation. They are comparing it with, say, 20, med 20 minutes of some meditation, which is taught by some other, some breathing exercise taught by some group, 10 minutes of mindfulness taught by some group, or once a week going to a church and doing some... Mass at the jail. So from that reference point of view, what we are asking for seems to be very demanding. It's not easy. So of course, we could say that chanting is easy in its own way, and that's a different subject. But the point is, we have a frame of reference. It's not just that our, not that our message is irrelevant. The frame of reference in which we present the message is often irrelevant. Because people live in a very different world today. So I'll give one more example that I would like to have your feedback also on this. This has struck me very strongly after I, I just came for a three months tour of America. And so many times when I would talk with college kids or with Western people in general, it's, there's so much, there's such a problem of, of uh, families breaking down. It's happening in India also, but not at that rate. So if we talk about how family attachment is a source of bondage. 
and that is a completely irrelevant message because you know in today's world there is hardly any family attachment there is so it one says to talk about to talk about renunciation to people who have aversion that is that is so if somebody is sattva guna you can take that they are already responsible in their family you have to think of something higher to think of something higher don't just be a take a take a think of your family in this life think of beyond this life think of the soul not just the body but here we are living in a culture where people are not even thinking about the body they not even material material responsibility also is not there so parents have done i don't want to uh, generalize and criticize all of america there are a lot of people who are responsible and especially those who are those who are following christian values do take do have respect family then there are others also but the point is the majority of the audience the family attachment is not the problem for them it is it is rather a, a lack of sense of purpose a lack of sense of responsibility and in those terms our message seems irrelevant so these are just couple of example that i had of how relevance means that we understand the needs of people and not just the needs our frame of reference and their frame of reference they need to match otherwise we may be speaking words that are that are that are intelligible but the message won't be intelligible the message won't make any sense to them i hope i am making sense by what i am saying You're making a lot of sense. <clears throat> Prabhupad came from Vrindavan, which is a, a circle of intense, concentrated Krishna consciousness. It's a user-friendly environment. In India, Vrindavan, Indi India itself is a, a Krishna conscious context. But Prabhupada wasn't content to stay within the circle in which Krishna consciousness was accepted and which was common and which was appreciated. But he wanted to go beyond the circle of India outside of that circle to do things that would make krishna conscious relevant and matter to people in the world in general and when he arrived in america he had to make some changes from the traditional framework he had to reduce the number of rounds he had to allow ladies to live in the temple and to serve side by side with men so in your travels between india and america you you raised a much bigger issue than than we'd intended uh to address today the very framework itself um but but Prabhupada made some changes contextual changes practical changes to make krishna conscious more accessible and relevant outside the circle of india now what do we need to do to continue that tradition to make krishna conscious more accessible to wider and wider audiences especially when they come to us on a sunday afternoon to check us out for the first time mm. yes so thank you so when i start looking at uh, uh the topics which i could potentially speak on no uh, i see it like a pyramid let's talk about the topics and it's like we could have i try to classify them as of say general wisdom spiritual wisdom and bhakti wisdom so it could be like a pyramid and depending on where the audience is likely to be so if we just give bhakti wisdom only so bhakti wisdom means say how to improve our chanting or uh, how to read uh, how to regularly read the prabhupad's books mm, these are this is bhakti wisdom but so if we are talking about how, how to read the prabhupad's books to somebody who thinks that you know this whole body of scripture is just a mythology and then somebody has written a commentary on the mythology and you are thinking about how to regularly read that commentary on a mythology it just seems so self referentially irrelevant for people so in that sense if we consider that that this wisdom wisdom is basically how can i live more meaningfully how can i add some value to my life this is not necessarily in a self centered sense 
but but there is a search for people wanting to live wanting to find meaning and purpose in their lives and especially in the post pandemic time this has become all the more where there are the phenomena called the uh, uh, the great resignation and other things where people don't want to go to jobs which 9 to 5 which which are they say suck their souls they want to even if they don't earn so much they want to do something which is meaningful for them so it is so in one sense to present the bhakti wisdom in a present the wisdom of our tradition in a way that is relevant for people that is something which is relevant that means what what are people looking for right now because they ultimately they are looking for krishna but initially they are not looking for krishna so they are looking for something which is um, which will address their immediate needs and for me the best example of this is the dhru maharaj past time in the bhagavatam that how uh, three things happen in the dhru maharaj past time first is that we could say that dhru maharaj has just got insulted which is the bhagavad gita says speak we poison is honor and dishonor and what kind how much ego the small five year old child he has such a big ego what what kind of ego maniac is this person this person is doomed but narad muni says there's a verse in the bhagavatam where he says that man bhangam amrushyatam aho kshatriya tejasam man bhangam amrushyatam how wonderful is the how wonderful the kshatriyas that they cannot tolerate dishonor so rather than rather than just dismissing him for being egoistic he appreciates that he has the courage to do something which very few people can do leave home and search for something so i think that basic point before we can have relevance or as a part of being relevant we need to appreciate what is good in the audience and that's where if our reference style is oh these people are breaking all the great principle they are doing this they are doing that they are just materialistic if there is not appreciation then we just can't then if, even if we try to speak on topic that is relevant it will come off as very manipulative so that was shila prabhupad's uh, uh, could say strength prabhupad genuinely cared for people uh, that's what now you can you can correct me if you want but what from whatever i've heard from shila prabhupad disciple directly and through their classes and their books they like prabhupad the prabhupad was aware of the fact that many of them were not having the best of habits and best of culture but prabhupada appreciated them prabhupada valued them prabhupada cared for them for what they were doing uh, for for what was good in them and so that basic appreciation if it is not there uh, relevance will not work so you need to start with what is good in people and this one thing that a pe- lot of people are looking for meaning and purpose they are not just happy with oh i want a job i i want a family i want to have children i want to have prestige in society so they want those things no doubt but that's not what is primarily driving them today there's definitely a lot of people are looking for meaning and purpose and i think that's a big big uh, uh, demographic that we can definitely become much more relevant to okay let me ask you um you talked about um people uh, having having their their basic qualities and having concerns on a general level as being the basis of the pyramid so when you um plan or think about an upcoming sunday talk what uh i i assume that you agree with me that it that the talks would be thematic rather than based on a single scriptural verse assuming that we agree with that what are some of the themes that you present in your talks that fulfill the dual purpose of uh addressing the needs of your audience as well as acknowledging their strong points yes thank you bro now yes can we start from a verse well in some places it's helpful but when what happens is we may get caught in the verse itself so now in now if you're talking about the west there are different demographics prominently we have indians who are currently coming to our temples and we could talk about making so much is more relevant even for indians because even if you consider the, the number of indians in america we are barely tapping even less than 1% of them but i think your your focus is more on 
more on american people in our western people in the west primarily i think, I think when you address a, a, a talk to a western or at least a diverse audience my experience is the indians are right there they they really uh relate even to the problems that our westerns are facing even if they're not facing that problem themselves because of a better upbringing and a more wholesome uh, orientation mm -hmm. they do resonate they do resonate so i think the more yeah. of a diverse audience you reach you're gonna that that's not gonna turn off the indians that's a good point so i, I agree with you then it's better to start with the theme and the verse can be a launching pad if it's required in the particular format. But, but it's not required. Is, but it's not required. No, I, 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 sometimes you start from a verse, then it becomes an unfamiliar launching point. Again, uh, if it is, it depends. If somebody, if the people are already in, know the Bhagavad Gita, are interested in the Bhagavad Gita, or something well, like that. Let's, let's, let's take this scenario. Let's say we evolve in America to the point where we're promoting in a really professional way, our Sunday programs on Facebook, okay? And part of that promotion involves naming the speaker who's going to speak next Sunday and what the topic is, okay? So are you going to put on Facebook that he's going to speak on the Srimad Bhagavatam, first chapter, eighth, eighth, first canto, eighth chapter, 19th verse? Okay. Let me ask that question. Okay. <laughs> that is true. I think that is that makes it completely... It's like we are doing an excellent job of making the class unappealing. <laughs> <laughs> so it's almost like those who have to come, they come in spite of the promotion, not because of the promotion. <laughs> so yeah, from that perspective, definitely thematic is required. Now, from what I understand is that there are like three broad needs. Now, there could be many, but we can look at the many needs of people and then we can look at which of the needs can our philosophy serve, the wisdom that we have serve. So my understanding is that it's, uh, it's like managing one's mind, emotions, managing relationships, and you could, you could use the word passion in a positive sense, like finding one's purpose, finding one's passion, aligning with one's nature. These are three broad topics, they're related. But the way I see it is that this is very much in alignment with um, our own uh, our own tradition, where we understand the soul is actually covered by three circles: the body mind circle, the social body mind is the adhyatmic, the social circle that is adi bhautik, and then there is the environmental circle that is adi ad, adi daivik. So basically. Uh, if, okay, you know, how do I better manage my body, mind, machine? How do I manage my drive, uh, the urges, the moods, the impulses, and especially the negative emotions, the oscillations. So managing the mind and emotions is a big topic, which can, which is first, I would say. Second is managing relationships. And if we consider the Bhagavatam, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, uh, they are filled with relationships. And there are a lot of principles that could be drawn. The culture is different. Some of the underlying assumptions that are by which people operate in that culture are different. But still, there are universal principles. Now, when people watch, say, people watch remakes of Shakespeare's plays or Jane Austen's novels, you know, they understand that it's from a different culture. But still, the principles of relating with human beings are, are universal. So the relationships is another. And the third is, okay, the world is such a confusing place. What am I meant to do in this world? Yeah, so what is my calling? What is my passion? What is my nature? Uh, Christians often use the word finding your shape. So God-given shape or something like that. So these, these are things which I have found click very, very much with people. So these, these are topics which would be uh, perennially relevant. Now, beyond that, there could be something which is contextually relevant if some issue has happened in the current affairs and that we would like to comment on that. But that's different. But these are these are issues I my understanding is when you speak on these, it's it's very it connects with people a lot. When you um, research for your talks, what kind of what's your modus operandus? Do you 
do you do you just start out with a search term do you do you do database do you do google do you also have an access to vaishnav commentators do you um do you do you do statistics do you try to prove the ancient um axioms with modern statistical evidence do you tell stories when when you're starting a talk from scratch let's say what what are the number one number two number three and number four things that you do okay mm. well i wish i were that organized but <laughs> somehow uh, my classes are organized but i'm not very organized about organizing my classes <laughs> if i may put it that way well, for the rest of us that aren't as brilliant as you are oh, what, thank you okay so two, what, would, things, what would you do if you put yourselves in our shoes no not like that i could say that i have become more lazy over the years but uh, as I can see that uh, my memory and my intelligence, what it was at 35, is not the same as 45. So I am recognizing that I need to become more organized in organizing my thoughts. So two, three things. Uh, I feel. I, I know that you have. You often illustrate your talks with PowerPoints, and that in itself requires organizational time. Yes, that is true. That's one thing I started with. So see, there are some things which we all are. Uh, we all there could like there are many points which you mentioned. That we which could be used. So there are some things which uh, which uh, I relate with a lot, and some things I don't relate with that too much. So statistics, I personally am not particularly fascinated by statistics. Somehow, because I feel that I study statistics in my college, and I have several friends who are statisticians, and statistics can be used to tell whatever story you want to tell. So in that sense. So it's not to minimize statistics in any way or not to minimize the profession of statistics. But what happens is that generally, if you're going to quote some statistics, we have to give some broader context in which the statistics have been quoted. And that takes a good amount of time. So that a lot of people are depressed today. A lot of people have addictions. That a lot of people are, like there's a family breakdown. I don't think we need statistics to establish this point. That's something which is reasonably well accepted. So, but statistics can be a very powerful tool initially to, to drive home the importance of a topic if people don't consider the topic to be important. That the sheer scale of the problem, that is something which is so in that sense to, it could be very relevant. Personally, I don't use it much, but it could be very relevant. So, or I find, I, th I find three things which I use a lot. One is quotes. Second is visuals, and third is metaphors. So, I since my childhood, one of, one of my hobbies was just reading a lot of quotes by different authors, and then and then trying to memorize them. And there's a saying in writing that the best writers are the best robbers. <laughs> if you steal from one person, that is plagiarism. If you steal from a hundred people, that is creativity. <laughs> so many times I find that if I talk about the hierarchies like good wisdom and goodness, spiritual wisdom and bhakti wisdom. So there are many many thinkers across the world's traditions who have given very good wisdom at the at the goodness level at least, sattvic wisdom, we can say. Sometimes some spiritual wisdom also, rarely bhakti wisdom, but they have given and either using their quotes or you know taking their quotes as launching pads for for rephrasing and rewording and conveying uh, the bhakti uh, our traditions truths so quotes i find are quite powerful we could so now we often use scriptural quotes and quotes from our acharyas now there are two things there is one is giving authenticity to our teachings and the second is giving appeal to our teachings so quoting from our tradition will bring authenticity. Mm. But using quotes from quotes from contemporary authorities or people who are respected in the contemporary world, or just quotes that are that that give wisdom in a memorable way, that brings appeal for the audience. So in that sense, if you're looking at a diverse audience, I would say using quotes from contemporary sources 
is very helpful. It connects with people and we don't have to necessarily emphasize the courses, the sources too much. You could say this, uh, you know, this, I, uh, I quote uh, some Mark Twain or something just like that. And they made some points that they are helpful. So that's the first thing quotes I use. And I, over the years, I have prepared a database and nowadays quotes are quite popular to share on social media. So many people also prepare, uh, many websites are there with quotes like that. Tell us just a bit about your database, how you how you have it indexed so you can match. You're, you're putting together a talk on, say, how not to complain. And so how do you find the quotes that are going to be relevant for that talk in your database? Hmm. OK, so that is tough. I'm also hoping to organize something now. So on my I have a website, Gita Daily where I have created a structure and I'm trying to use that structure in my course also. So I have to talk like nourish yourself, nourish your relationships and nourish your devotion. Nourish then, yourself, yeah. nourish your relationships and nourish your devotion. Yeah. So, so you know, those are the three broad categories under which you put the quotes? Yes, I put my quotes and even my uh, analogies also, which I, well, I'll talk about the metaphors a little later. But I, the, the, the three broad categories. And then in nourish yourself, there could be many things, resisting temptation, Dealing with uh, dealing with adversities, becoming more mindful. So it could be and those are topics. Those are actually search topics in your database, right? Yes. So it's like I've been trying out different softwares. So I've tried Evernote, OneNote, the softwares which you, know, you can make a notebook and you can have sections within the notebooks, and then sections you can have pages within them. So nowadays through digital searching has become relatively easier. Mm. So that is the that is the current situation. Uh, what I'm I'm uh, so that's the with respect to quotes. That's what I use quite a bit by Krishna's mercy, and uh, I find that that does create some impact. Now, you want to comment on this further? Well, I've seen that you also use a lot of uh, in your talks. Uh, there are what is the word you use? Hithi. No, not is it something something that you stimulates people every two three minutes? Some some rhyming words, some what is it the word sticky words or something like that? P i t h y pithy pithy phrases pithy phrases pithy phrases yeah. It seems like every every successful preacher has a lot of those. Like to make your mess a message, turn your test into a testimony. A famous one that I've heard you talk about is uh, material science studies matter, spiritual science studies what matters. Yeah. It seems like every successful preacher has a whole catalog of those. Yeah, that is true. Definitely we all have this. One of the things which I say is that we may have to live with pain, but we don't have to live in pain. Mm. What it, do it doesn't happen to you, it happens for you. <laughs> That's beautiful, yeah. What is it? Yeah. Suff suffering is suffering. What does it say? Uh, pain is mandatory. Suffering is optional. Yes, yeah, true. Where do you? Where? How does one? You know, like again, I'm putting. I'm thinking of a young preacher, someone who wants to cut his teeth on some Sunday classes and make a difference. Is there a? Is there any? Way to again? Do you have a database of, of pithy phrases cataloged and indexed as well, or is it just kind of in your mind after a, a lifetime of preaching? Okay, so actually, when I currently I write on the Gita every day at gitadili.com, so every article almost either the title or the summary is is something like a quote. So in that sense, the gitadili.com itself is a resource which. I have, I can just, if, if I may, I'll just share my screen and show it to you quickly. And can anyone subscribe to that just by Googling Gita Daily? Oh, yes, Gita.com, certainly they can subscribe. Mm -hmm. So there are, yeah, here there is, so. I get your Gita Daily every day in my inbox. Oh, okay. So this is. The way it is here, for example, if I go date-wise, chapter-wise, let's look at uh, some, of are, some of the quotable quotes are, there are quotes right now, to be awake is to be aware of our week. 
that's a quote over here <laughs> so how our actions are impacting the world impacting those around us that's a so this is chapter 7 wise so now um, our mind is influential but it is also influential enunciation meant to help us look up at the world not look up at krishna not look down at the world so our attachments are like a rented house that we don't usually leave unless we are evicted so each of these is either the either that title itself is the quote or if we click on this then then we can go there and then there will be a quote in that so that that's a that's available to the public that whole index everyone can use that yes excellent so, and that's on your website you can access it through your website yes. spiritual scientist yes okay this i think what this would be an amazing resource for young preachers yeah if we are grateful when ability manifests through us we can be graceful when it doesn't mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. things like that so i think this is a reservoir now i plan to put all these separately as quotes on other websites so i have three websites the spiritual scientist is my first website where mostly my audio and classes are there second is the gita daily where a lot of quotes like these can be found and then i have another website my name is chaitanya charan so i am there it's not not a very active website but there i am planning to put all these quotes under chaitanya charan chaitanyacharan.com okay i'm there i'm there so fast mm, okay so thank you <laughs> so that is with respect to quotes um, and uh, if i may how do you can i turn this question around because i would also like to learn from you how do you come up with pithy sentences you also read extensively and find them out i have a lot in my head um but i also subscribe to some christian sermon resources one's called e sermons and one's called sermon central they're each 99 dollars a year and uh they provide a whole database of christian sermons so that you can search um by any individual topic and you can search by humor you can search by illustrations but what i like to do is i just like to search by sermons and then you go through the sermon and the word that you've searched for is highlighted and if there's any stories or any phrases that go with that then of course all that's there as well so that saves me going through the internet in general because this is um this is all separated out from you know google in general and it's specifically a resource for preachers to find stories and illustrations and pithy phrases and all that saves me a lot of time it would be amazing if uh, we had a database of iskon preachers also that categorized uh, all of our talks and sorted out you know searchable stories searchable phrases and all it's a huge job but it would certainly be um a wonderful resource for preachers yeah i agree fully yes with, with respect to this one point christian i am some i am amazed by the level of organization that uh, christians do with respect to the content with respect to the content preparation content uh, accessibility and um, yeah we need there's a lot that we could learn it seems prabhupada also said that our organization and intelligence our movement will spread so organize let me just say one is... word too one word too i know there's a certain hardcore level of devotees that would uh, raise an objection sometimes a very very rancorous rejection to quoting meters to quoting non devotees to quoting karmis to quoting christians and all um but our our um emphasis in in trying to up our relevance quota in america is on tools that's all we're we're um looking for tools that will help us be more effective if if a christian hands you the wrench that you need a muslim hands you the wrench that you need a mediator hands you the wrench that you need that's going to help you do the work that you need done then why would you why would you quibble over about where it's coming from the point is yeah it's going to it's going to work and so do do you find uh, do you find that, that that kind of approach helps you not be too sensitive to criticism from certain quarters yes um, one of my favorite uh, traditional metaphors for this is that when when lord ram and his vanaras 
his monkey soldiers were trying to build a bridge across the ocean uh, to go from the indian subcontinent to lanka at that time they didn't think that we have to get rocks only from our kingdom that we have to go to ayodhya and we are the, the bridge has to be built with the rocks only from ayodhya no from wherever the bridge rocks are available use the rocks the means are not as important as the purpose the purpose was to actually reach sita and rescue sita so i i feel that we have to be very very careful about the the, the ultimate message uh, the ultimate direction in which our message is pointing but to point the message in that direction as i said the tools that we use the means that we use can and some not can not only can be but need to be circumstantial so it's like if <clears throat> if you are going to build a temple in america we don't have to get the rocks and the bricks and the cement from india to build a temple over there the point is that even the architecture might be somewhat similar to might not be exactly indian but who is the, who is at the sanctum sanctorum in that temple that is the important thing so like that um, my understanding is that if if we are building a coherent message and it is pointing towards a core conclusion or a core point that is in consonance with our tradition that is that is key to our tradition then how we build up that point that is up to each person and some devotees may prefer to build that point with quoting only traditional sources but traditional means tra- sources from our own tradition some may build it by using contemporary sources um but, but i feel that more than the more than the particular particular the sources for the particular points that we are making we have to focus on how that point is leading to the central argument contributing to central argument and what that central argument is so i don't feel that using different tools to achieve the same result is compromising or minimizing our philosophy or going against Prabhupada's mood um as long as is as, as long as what you have in the circle as long as what you have when people get in is krishna chanting hari krishna offering your food associated with devotees you you know if, if there's a difference between opening a different door to give people access to your inner circle and changing what's in the inner circle and i think critics within our devotional community often make this mistake that because you're using a di- you're you're opening a different door they think that you only have to come in through one door you to get to the inner down. circle but it seems to me that preaching successful preaching and relevance means that you're going to create multiple doors based on multiple audiences and multiple interests that's not the same thing as compromising what's inside the door am i right or wrong that's beautifully put if we don't have multiple doors some doors may just not be relevant may not be accessible or appealing for some people so yes beautiful example so what we are saying is that the now for example prabhupad addressed the counter culture and then my, he also adopted some of the like the idea of a love feast or stay high forever these are all counter cultural terms that became came prominent it's interesting that prabhupad actually even came up with the word iskon in america in india at those days the word consciousness was not very common krishna was common but consciousness has now become well known in india so my understanding is that krishna consciousness that phrase prabhupad actually coined it in america i haven't seen it anywhere written uh, in prabhupad's writing in prabhupad back to godhead before 1944 at that time i haven't seen that over there the so, counterculture was obsessed with the idea of consciousness yes so prabhupad himself has set the example in the very name of the organization that he started so of being relevant 
some some uh, Latin American communities they like dance, they like color. Some other uh, African communities, you know, based on what their conditioning is and what they're what they're familiar with, you might have to create another type of a door for them, another door for people who live in Europe and different European countries. It seems to me that when you when you when you fish, for instance, you don't put on the end of the hook what you like, but you put on the end of the hook <laughs> what the fish likes. Oh God! When you put it that way, it's 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 uh, not just it's common sense; it's lack of it is is shocking level of not lack of common sense. <laughs> just yeah, true. You know, we have to put. We have to. We, some people insist we put on the hook. The same thing we put on the hook in 1970, and it's going to work in 2022, 50, 52 years later. Well, that that doesn't necessarily follow. True. I mean, we're trying to get everyone to the same place. We all share the same. Now, now this is a great point that uh, you you talked about with Radhika Raman in Faith and Reason. The 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 what what doesn't change in Krishna consciousness is the practices, the chanting of the rounds, the taking of prasad, the association of devotees. Those are the core elements of Krishna consciousness. But how you bring them to that can be, can be multiple, multiple ways, depending on the audience. You, to preach without considering the audience is like fishing without considering the fish. Would you agree with me? Beautifully put. Fishing without considering the fish. It's a, you know, in some ways, the metaphor of fishing might seem a little, a little, what is the word for it? Are people like fish and we are baiting them? But I think that you are talking from a Christian perspective that be a fisherman of men or something like that. Jesus also says that. But the point is well taken that, you know, if we want to, like, it's almost like, if we want to reach people today and somebody is making, say, if we consider somebody is making movies today and they make movies of the kind which were made in the 1970s. Well, there will be some demographic which are, who are filled with nostalgia and they like them, but most people will not. So, yeah. Mm. We, we don't have practice. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, please. <laughs> so, just... Uh, uh, and there are these three modes, goodness, passion, and ignorance. So it's almost that our attitude toward change is shaped by these three modes. Hmm? So if, if we are in ignorance, we just let ourselves, we feel we are helpless, that we underestimate our capacity. Just let ourselves get swept away by the change. If we are in passion, we overestimate our capacities and we try to deny or prevent the change. Hmm. So, so we could say in ignorance, there is compliance. Compliance, we just become compliant to whatever changes there. In passion, we define ourselves by resistance to change. But we could say in, in goodness, there is resilience amid change. But okay, there are certain things which I have to, which I, I'll have to change with those things. But there are certain things which I'll not change with. So, to some extent, while we may talk about a message of transcendence, our approach might be like throwing the same fish again and again. It's, it's, it may reek of passion that we are trying to control the world and deny the change. But Krishna says, I am time. And time is a primary change of change factor. So it's almost like our own tradition tells us to see Krishna in the times that we are in. The changes that are wrought by time are, are not just mundane changes. We understand that Krishna is acting through those changes. So in one sense, understanding the times is not just being contemporary. It is being conscious of Krishna as time. And we may be conscious of Krishna as the holy name, conscious of Krishna as deities. But are we conscious of Krishna as not just time in the sense that minutes of my life are passing. But Krishna is time in the sense that he is the agent ultimately who is bringing about a change in the world. And okay, what kind of changes have been brought about now by Krishna's agency of change? And what, what doors has it closed for me to share Krishna? 
and what door has is open for me to share Krishna. So that uh, that attitude, I think when I present Krishna as time, then you know it changes the framework. Then we, it's not just adapting Krishna's message to the world, rather it's like attuning ourselves to Krishna in the world. It's a different thing. Wow, I'm I'm gonna just edit that part out and have it as a standalone morsel in the irrelevant series of shows that was just so wonderful what you just said thank you Prabhu, i've taken a lot of your time but i just want to conclude in an area that's very important um would you agree with me that you hardly can give a relevant talk without including stories and I find, in my experience, stories are of four types. There are stories from the scriptures, from Srimad Bhagavatam, Mahabharata, Ramayana, Chaitanya, Chaitanya. There are um, stories from my own personal experience, times that I've realized the truths of Krishna consciousness or even felt Krishna in my own life. And then there are uh, stories that, have, that are not ISKCON generated stories, that are not scriptural stories, but there are stories of contemporary people who achieved a, a dream, who achieved a dream through relying upon a, a, a sense of God consciousness. I actually forget right now what the fourth type of story is. Oh, other scriptures, like biblical stories and all. So first of all, would you agree with me that without... A, at least one story, a half an hour talk is not going to be nearly as compelling. Would you go further to, to say that there should be more than one story in a talk? Would you, would you specifically say, do you, do you consciously try to have, say within a half an hour's time, X number of stories? And how do you, how do you value these different categories of stories according to their effectiveness? Yes, bro. So stories are very important. Somehow I am poor at telling stories. I'm I love metaphors and uh, metaphors and comparisons, which involve some brief anecdotes. But but I whenever I have told story, told stories, they're really very helpful. And I love this classification which you have made. So now certainly scriptural stories are there, and I have found that if we present them appropriately, uh, then there are this, there are a lot of people who are interested in stories. Now they may not accept the stories as ultimate realities. They may not see the stories as the way we see them. But still, stories as something interesting happening and learning something from it. People are quite open to even scriptural stories presented appropriately. Then the most powerful I find is in terms of establishing. Uh, um, there is you know, within the tradition we focus on establishing our authority. That I am quoting from scripture. But for most people today, authority is not as important as authenticity. And authenticity often comes by telling our stories. That is now, okay, how did this principle work in my life? Or how did I realize this? How did I come to with the conviction that I have, I has a conviction, a conviction that I have right now? So those are the kind of stories that I am trying to add more and more. And I have, I'm finding that uh, journaling helps me a lot. So I, I have taken some seminars on journaling also. I have a course on journaling. But when I journal, uh, whenever I, I'm journaling regularly, naturally in my, my classes, I explain my uh, incidents from my life, from my observations, from my, even my from pre-devotional pre life, they come. And they add a lot of, uh, they lot uh, bring authenticity to the message. So scriptural stories are one, one wonderful, but our own stories, now there is a danger over here that we may get caught in telling our own stories and we may tell the story very entertainingly, but then the point from the story may not be that powerfully told. So that is one of the challenges in telling a story. People remember the story and they forget the point of the story. So now if this is where I feel scriptural stories are safer, because even people remember the story, they connect with Krishna and that sense. But if we are going to tell other stories, then yeah, tell the story, but make sure that the point is adequately emphasized. So 
that's one precaution and i'm quite open to taking stories from various sources so if i understand right what you think is from our tradition maybe from our experience from other traditions and we could say from the contemporary world contemporary success stories or contemporary inspire motivational inspirational stories and a lot of values so in one sense in our own tradition there is that example of the honey bee who goes to various flowers and takes nectar from those flowers so chanakya pandit also says in accept gold even from a filthy place so yes we may we can i i feel that we can draw from various places now i now i am looking in the sense do you have any resources where you get your stories from uh my own life <laughs> it's amazing how many times when i'm preparing a talk uh and it usually comes towards the end it usually doesn't come right in the beginning what i what i like to do is is illustrate the point from scripture and then i i like to to give the seed of the scriptural story within the first 30 you know the first one third of the talk and then and then discourse on it in the such a way that it connects with what people are going through come back to it a second time discourse on it and come back to it a third time so i i think oh. the scriptural story is more effective if you kind of break it up and explain it in a contemporary way at, at throughout it so it's like a thread that goes throughout the whole talk and then in the middle or towards the end then i talk about how this same principle you know what happened to drew and what happened to prolad in a very very small minor way happened in my own life and i find that as i go back through the archives of lectures given over say 50 years the one the ones that really give me goosebumps that i feel like have really gotten through are almost always the ones that i told a personal story amazing goosebumps yeah? that's a beautiful way of putting it because you're what could be more relevant than saying i'm here this is what happened it works what could be more uh compelling than that Mm. True. Amazing, bro. That's so beautiful. The story is, and uh, then do you consciously uh, contemplate your own life to come up with these story? It is come up stories from your life, or that's been something which you have been doing for a long time. So it's almost like a default instinct for you. It triggers. It triggers. You know, the preparation of the talk triggers triggers the story. you know one uh, recently I was talking about generational blessings how if Chris, you know maybe your father or your grandfather had a dream but some other circumstances didn't align in his life that he could fulfill the dream but then the dream uh, uh took fruit in you his son you know my father had a gift for telling stories and public speaking but um he couldn't go to college he didn't get the tools the, to to be able to you know get the career where he could do that for a living he went to war you know world war 2 happened just just when he was coming of age and he had to go into the army then he got married then he got a job only a few times did the preacher at our church ask dad to give a lay lay sermon so maybe a half a dozen times in his life did he get the chance to actually preach now when i graduated grade school i was the valedictorian of a very small class So if dad was much more excited about me being the valedictorian than I was. He coached me, he suggested a theme, he had me rehearse in front of a mirror, and needless to say it was a big hit. But dad never got more than a half a dozen chances to do public speaking in his life, although he was clearly gifted for it. But I conservatively estimating have been able to speak publicly in Krishna consciousness, what to speak of the radio and stuff like over 10,000 times. So that dream which was in my father's heart passed down and took birth in me and wherever my father is right now, I know that he would be more happy to know that I gave birth to the dream than if he had done it himself. It's a beautiful way of putting it, huh? Thank you. So Krishna fulfills all desires. <laughs> that's amazing so it's this is also one important thing which sometimes we 
um, uh, that what happens is that we sometimes think there's a radical discontinuity between uh, between okay, all that I learned in the past is Maya, it's illusion, and now I'm becoming Krishna conscious. But we are products of our past. Maybe our past doesn't uh, doesn't determine the direction in which we are going, but our past does determine the the overall kind of thinking that we have, the body mind machine that we have, which we'll be using. When you were seven, Krishna was preparing you for where you are now. When you were fifteen. Krishna was preparing you. We didn't see it at the time. We may not have been aware of it in the interim period. But so often when we're putting together these lectures, bingo, it comes out, out of your, your distant past and you put, you connect it and you see that Krishna, even, even in my father, even before I was born, Krishna was preparing. And it fits very much with what you're saying about seeing Krishna in time. For him, past, present, and future are like a fruit that he holds in his hand. Mm, Paul, beautiful, huh? Flute. Is it a flute with past, present, and future? Fruit. 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 Okay, okay. A fruit. A fall. A fruit. Fruit. Okay, that's beautiful. Yes, true. So, Krishna, so one of the things which I often, you know, when we took off appreciating people, Maybe we could conclude with this. I, I have slowly started recognizing that there are two aspects of Krishna consciousness. And this is something which, in one sense, in the Christian tradition, they focus a lot on how God loves you. Hmm? In our tradition, we focus a lot on how we are meant to love God. Hmm? And you have to show your love by this, waking up in the morning, by doing this, doing this, not doing this. So now both are important in the relationship. But what happens is, we can say there are two aspects of Krishna consciousness when we are approaching people. You know, what they are doing in relationship with Krishna. You say, oh, this person doesn't come to a temple, this person doesn't even follow the follow basic principles of morality or whatever. So that is one way, and that is the way we look at normally. But it's another way of looking at it is, okay, what is Krishna doing in this person's life? And that, that really expands the universe of Krishna consciousness. Because then we just see beyond, okay, this person is eating, eating this kind of food or is having this kind of, uh, of particular habits and this and that. We see, okay, the very fact that this person has come to a place where they're coming to a temple or coming to a Sunday program, they're interacting with devotee. Krishna has done something in that person's life because of which this person is here right now. So when we look at it from that perspective, it just opens up a huge new dynamic for Krishna consciousness. It reminds me of Tasmadi Dam Daivav Totom Vyavashav Tasmahu Biti Nahi Pahi Prabhu. After Yudhishthira was made the king, he was questioning everything that had, that had brought him to the throne. And Bhisma said, you know, if you don't accept this, if you don't embrace this wholeheartedly, you're basically an atheist. So Krishna worked from within the heart of people to bring them along to the Sunday feast. Krishna did... 99% of the work to get that person after millions and millions of lifetimes to make the choice to come to the Sunday feast and check out the Hare Krishnas. Now, if you don't do your level best, if you don't take what Krishna has done and you don't seize that opportunity by preparing your talk and tailoring it for that particular person and recognizing what Krishna has done in their life, then what Bhisma said to Yudhisthira could apply to you that you don't believe in God. <laughs> That's very sovereign. Krishna, Krishna, amazing. <laughs> Prabhu, I can't tell you how happy I am. You know, what often happens is we start with notes. You know, we premeditate. We try to figure what's going to be the, the subject matter of the talk. But so often, especially with someone as realized and as brilliant as you are, there are many, many other points which are turned out of that discussion. So I can't wait to listen to this a third or a fourth or a fifth time. I intend to break it up into chewable, digestible little tidbits, of which there are many. Um, this, this to me is uh, like a gold mine, okay? So um, it's not over because I think it's going to 
reactivate, reappear in the in the minds and careers and ambitions of many, many generations of future preachers to come. And I know even as myself, I've done a lot of preaching, but I've learned so much from you this afternoon that I can't tell you how grateful I am that you took the time out of your busy schedule to join us and benefit us with your vast knowledge and realizations. Thank you, Prabhuji. Thank you, Prabhu. I'm grateful to be of service. And I see your kind words as your blessings and Prabhupada's blessings. I can continue my small service. Thank you, bro. I look forward Thank to you having well. your association again in future. Let us offer our respectful obeisance to all the Vaishnava devotees of the Lord who are just like desire trees who can fulfill the desires of everyone and are full of compassion on the fallen conditioned souls. Hare Hare Bo. Hare Krishna. Thank you, bro. Hare Krishna.